Today, I want to talk about something a little bit different. So when you're first learning the program, in my mind, there are two main things you need to learn. And one of them is considerably easier than the other. The first thing is learning a programming language. And honestly, learning a programming language is really, really simple. And once you know one, they're all really easy to pick up after that because even though some of them might have, you know, advantages over the others, basically they all come down to the same structure. Once you understand the structure of a programming language, you just need to understand the different grammar for those languages, and it's pretty straightforward from there. The hard part of learning to program is learning to think programmatically. What I mean by this is being able to take a problem, doesn't matter what the problem is, being able to break it down into smaller components so that you can understand. So say you wanted to do something like a word processor. You would have to understand, okay, what actually makes up a word processor? Okay, so I need some way to actually display text. I need some way to input text. I need some way to actually do formatting to it. All of these little things. And then from there, you need to be able to take those smaller components and then explain it in a way that the computer can understand because when you're programming a computer will only do what you tell it to do so if you can't properly explain the problem to the computer and how to solve the problem to it there's no way that you can actually program properly. And when I say explain the problem to the computer, I don't mean any specific syntax. So let's say that right now you're writing a word processor in Python, for example, but later down the line you think, okay, Python is a bit too slow, I want to rewrite this in C. As long as you can understand the basic structure of what you're trying to do, it's not that much of a task to actually go and rewrite it in a completely different language. So we're going to work through an actual problem that I had. It is a very simple problem, but it still very much demonstrates the point. So this right here is an MP3 player because I'm a bit of a boomer and I like MP3 players. Basically, I bought this because I wanted to have some audio playing all the time so that I don't have to pull my phone out or just carry my phone with me everywhere I go. The problem with this though is that for whatever reason, when I'm playing over my wired headphones, it plays basically any audio file just fine. But over Bluetooth, only MP3 files work. So it's better just to have everything on the device in MP3 so that regardless of what sort of headphones I'm using, it'll play everything perfectly fine. And the audio files that I'm playing are just streams that I've ripped from YouTube through YouTube DL. Now, when you download audio from YouTube, YouTube doesn't actually store it as an MP3. It will store it as a WebM and M4A. And neither of those formats are actually going to work fine for my use case. But preferably, I'd also like to be able to play WAV files and really any other audio file I can come across. I just want some way to play it on this device. Even a problem this simple has a couple of things we should consider. So before we even think about what language you're going to be working with, let's first actually explain what the problem is. So I have this device which only plays MP3 files and I have a bunch of unknown audio files of various types. So I want to convert those files into MP3. That is basically what we're trying to do. Now, because we're trying to convert these files, there's two things we can consider here. Do we want to convert the audio files as they come in, or do we want to convert everything at once and then be done with it? Now, this is where it becomes important to understand more about how the software is going to be used. So in my case, what I try to do is that on the weekend, I'll go and download all the audio files I want to listen to for the next week and then copy them over to the device. So in this case, it seems to just make more sense to go and bulk convert them after they've all been downloaded. Now, if I wanted to convert them one by one, this would actually be a much more complex problem because then I have to think about how do I actually watch the place where the files are being stored? How do I make it so it's not just wasting resources for no reason? In this case, a bulk conversion is just much more straightforward. But you should still keep the other option as a consideration just in case the bulk conversion doesn't actually work out to be the best solution. Like, let's say, instead of downloading everything at the end of the week or start of the week, whatever you want to call it, I want to instead break it down and download stuff as the week actually goes. In that case, maybe it does make more sense to actually do it one by one, but until then, it makes more sense to do the most straightforward solution. Now, the next thing is how do we actually get the files into the program? So, one way we can go and do this is have the user manually supply all of the file names, whether that be in a bigger file or whether that be on the command line one by one. 
Now, the other way we can do this is by having all of the files in one location and then just trying to automatically grab all of them. So with the first solution, it does mean the user has to write much more than they otherwise would have to do and they may not always know exactly what the files are called. So I don't think that's really that good of a solution. As for the second option, this is something you have to manage outside of the application. So this is basically just having an input folder. The one problem with doing this is if a file that can't be converted makes its way into the folder, we have to have some way to actually handle that. Now, there's a couple of ways that can be handled. One of them is to maintain a list of accepted file types, and then if that file can't be converted, just go and skip over it. But this requires us actually maintaining a list of extra file types, and we're not always sure what file types we want to work with, so that's probably not the best solution. The second way is to just error out the application and stop the conversion, but this is also a problem because that's going to stop converting all of the other files. Now, the other way is to just try to convert it, and if it can't be converted, just move on. And even though that does require extra handling, it does mean that anything that can't be converted will just be dealt with without the user having to worry about it. Now, what about the files before they're being converted? Do we actually need them anymore? So in my case, I'm only going to be listening to them on the MP3 player, but if I was making this software for someone else, I would probably include some sort of way that says to the user, hey, do you want to delete these? Do you want to keep these? And if they say, no, I don't want them, and then just go and automatically clear them out. As for our input file, most of it is going to be M4A, but we're not entirely sure what it's going to be all of the time, so it's probably better to make the tool a bit more generic. As for the output format, there's not really any choice here. All we can do is MP3. Now for a program this simple, it makes sense to go through all of that process in your head. But don't think that you have to do it like that just because that's how I've done it. If you need to write stuff down for a problem like this, feel free to go and do that. In my case, a lot of the time I like to use a whiteboard. I have one off to the side here just because it gives you a lot of, you know, space to work with and you need to draw stuff. It's very easy to draw stuff on it, but you could also go and use paper or a Vim buffer or a spreadsheet, really anything you want to use to actually go and write stuff down. And when you're writing stuff down, it does typically make it easy to actually brainstorm stuff because you know exactly what you've already thought about. And when you go and read that text you've written down, it makes it easy to connect it to a future thought. As for an actual complex problem, like say a word processor, please just go and write stuff down instead because I can guarantee no matter how good you think your memory is, by the time you get to the end of your solution, you will probably have forgotten the beginning of it and you'll just be in this infinite cycle where you're not getting any work done. So just go and write it down. That's from prior experience. I've tried to do stuff like that before. It just doesn't end well. Now, the next thing is how are we going to implement this? And the first thing to consider here is what language and what libraries or tools are you going to be using? So if you only know one language, you're probably just gonna go with that language. But in my case, I would say that doing shell script is probably the best thing here, just because that's typically what I'll do for these various little scripts. There's no objectively correct choice here. It really depends on what you already know, what you're used to working with, and what you're willing to learn if you want to try out something new. I'm going with shell script though because I know it quite well. The syntax is very lightweight, even though if you're used to other programming languages, the syntax is a little bit weird, and also it makes it very easy to interact with the CLI tools I have installed on my system. But if I wanted to do this in like Go or Python, it would basically end up being the same thing. Now, when it comes to learning how to do something, some people are gonna live and die by the documentation. Now, the documentation for any language is really, really useful, especially when other people don't know a solution for what you're trying to do. But when it's something that, you know, a lot of people have already done, like let's say converting files, for example, like we're doing here, a lot of the time there will already be an existing solution, and the solution that I found requires using FFmpeg. So don't be afraid to ask people you know who are also developers or more likely going on places like Stack Overflow and looking up existing solutions. Some people will joke about how that makes you a bad programmer. I think that it's just a more productive use of your time because I'd much rather spend my time trying to solve new things rather than solving things that have been solved a thousand times before. Now, this isn't a live coding video, so I'm just going to show you what my solution looks like. Basically, we have this right here. 
So what I'm doing is I'm using a for loop. And what this basically means is take every single file in a folder and then look at each of the files and try to run what's inside of here on that file. So it's gonna try to convert every single file in the folder. And I'm using a program called FFmpeg, which is basically a suite of software for doing things like video editing and audio editing. Basically what I'm doing is I'm taking an input file, which is gonna be the file that I'm currently at inside of the loop. And I'm saying the format I wanna convert it to is going to be MP3. And then I wanna save that file into this spot here with the same name that it had before, but this time .mp3. And then after that's done, I'm going to delete the file. Now, originally this did look a little bit different. What I had is I had the rm command to actually delete the file on the line down here. Now these look very similar, but by having these two ampersands here, what that's gonna do is make it so this command here will only run if this command here runs successfully. If I have it on the next line, it might delete the file even if it doesn't convert properly. And during my testing, I found out that under some random conditions, sometimes audio files won't be converted properly. And then if I delete it, then obviously I don't have the converted file and I don't have the original file. Now this will actually make sure that any files that weren't supposed to be in that folder also won't be deleted. So I do have to go and manually move them out, but I feel like that's a perfectly fine solution because let's say I accidentally put like a tax document in there. I don't want to have that get deleted. I'd much rather it just be skipped over and that I can deal with it later. And FFmpeg being a very powerful application actually handles audio files completely generically. So we could pass in literally anything to this and it should convert it perfectly fine. We could even go and pass in video files and it should still strip out the audio file for us without us having to do anything extra. Now, depending on what tools you're working with, you may have way more implementation considerations to think about. So let's say you're working on a game and you're writing in something like Unity. So Unity being a game engine, engine does pretty much everything on the low end for you. So things like collisions and lighting, you can go and make them yourself, or you could just rely on the built-in versions, which are fine in a lot of cases. But then you could write a game in something like libgdx. libgdx isn't a game engine, it's just a library, so it won't do things like collisions for you, but it does provide a way to make collisions easier. Whereas then if you wanted to do something like, say, OpenGL, then you'd have to write basically everything yourself except writing to the screen. So hopefully this video gives you a rough idea about how you might actually break down a problem like this. Even though the end result was very, very short, it was only, what, four lines, and I can compress this down into one if I wanted to, it does actually help to go and think through a problem like this and break it down step by step just to make sure that you're not actually missing anything. Originally, I had that arm on the second line. If I didn't go back and actually think about it, it would always have slightly broken behavior. So I think that's going to be pretty much everything for me. Before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Chris, Joachim, Donald, Michael, Andre, Nathan, David, Montezar, Will, Brennan, Chico, Bento, Jamie, Joseph, Mitchell, Peter, the 22 Shah, and all my $2 supporters. If you'd like to go support my work, the links down below to my Patreon, subscribe, sell, leave pay, all of that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available basically anywhere. And then this channel is available on Odyssey, Library, and BitChute if you want to watch on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and... I'm out.